Institute and the Society of North America to introduce the keynote speaker, Mr. Stephen Knapp. Yes. Devotees and ladies and gentlemen, this is a special evening for us, Hindu Unity Day, 17th Unity Day. It is, my, it is a great honor and pleasure for me to, to introduce Mr. Stephen Knapp. He was born as a Christian, grew up as a young uh, student, as a child, as Christian. He was fascinated right from the beginning of, in his adolescent age, what is unknown science, what is mysticism, what is ancient mythology, yoga, and also spirituality of the East. He read many uh, religious issues and he was impressed with Bhagavad Gita once he read and assimilated he became the practitioner and the follower of Sanatana Dharma that is Hindu. Then he went on and got the blessings and the teachings of uh, uh, Sri Holi <coughs> Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada. His teachings made him much more follower of Hinduism and the Sanatana Dharma. And he, he traveled in India, almost all the states of India and visited temples, innumerable number of temples and he spoke to the people of India and he was so convinced, he spent so much time in, he has taken about 17,000 uh, photographies of different people, the temples and uh, met the individuals of great uh, like spirituality in India. And with that, he, he has the, you know, the knowledge, he had published many articles on Hinduism and uh, Vedanta. Vedanta is the one that he made much more um, into the Hinduism uh, point of view. Then, of course, he, he published 20 books on Vedanta. He is the founder of uh, um, World Relief Forum. He was one of the founders of Vedanta Friends Association. He is the most distinguished scholar that we can hear from him about Hindu unity and his experience. I present to you Mr. Stephen um, uh, Knapp, popularly known as Nandanananda Dasa. I will present to you right now. Thank you. Pleasure to be here, and I especially thank the organizers of this important event for inviting me, namely Arish Sahani, Nayan Naran, Naran Kataraya, and I am honored to be here and thank you all for attending. So I've got my script. I've got 30 minutes to talk, and I've timed this down to 30 minutes. So hopefully, if I don't get too far off base, I'll be done in 30 minutes. So anyway. But first of all, for those of you who might not know much about me, I'm a Hindu, follower of Sanatana Dharma. Or what I also call a Dharmist and a Krishna Bhakta. And I will be one until the day I die. Simple as that. No one can stop that. Vedic culture and its spiritual knowledge saved me, basically. It saved my life and gave me the real purpose for being here and what to do while I'm here in this world. And now this is all I do. My spiritual sadhana, my practice, my speaking engagements, my lecture tours of India, which I've been doing almost every year, writing over 20 books so far, to help spread and explain the importance of Vedic spiritual knowledge to as many people as possible. This is all I'm living for. This is only my, this is my only motivation. 
So I also help manage the local Krishna temple. I'm the chairman of the board there. And of course, anybody who's involved in temple management knows that involves a lot of different things. Anything can come up. I'm also the president of the Vedic Friends Association. And I'm also a direct disciple of, as you mentioned, his divine creation, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, which is how I got my name of Sri Nandanandana. And so I've been doing meditation and chanting the Hare Krishna mantra for over 40 years. And all of this, I can only say, has deepened my conviction of the profound nature of the Vedic system of spiritual realization. And I will tell you, I love what I do. I love being a Hindu. I love being a Krishna Bhakta. I love being a follower of Sanatana Dharma. I love following the Bhagavad Gita. And I love writing books about various aspects of Vedic culture and telling other people about it and what it has done for me and what it had, can do for them. So I like to share with others the good things I have found in life. And now that I've found Vedic Dharma, I like letting others know about it. But I'll tell you, I'll also fight to keep it and, and to keep my freedom to practice it. Why should I let anyone else take it away from me? It took me 20 years of my life to find it. it I wasn't just born into it like most of you. I had to look for it. It is a karmic privilege to be born into Vedic culture. So make sure you do not take it for granted. But by working to preserve and protect it is also my way of being a good Hindu. And this is what I call being a Vedic ambassador. We need more Vedic ambassadors, or those who can easily and willingly share the good points about Vedic culture and its philosophy, traditions, and its deep spiritual knowledge with others, especially those who are curious. And there are many who are looking for this spiritual knowledge, but they just don't know where to look. And they don't know that you've got what they want. You have to know that. You have to be bold enough to be able to give people what they're looking for. So this is not so difficult, and many people like to hear the story of someone's life and how they have grown or developed. So, in this way, let us all be Vedic ambassadors, persons who are not afraid to say that they are Hindu, and then be willing to share it with others. I'm also a Krishna Bhakta because Krishna wanted action from Arjuna, not a passive, apathetic person that runs away from battle or does nothing, but he wanted Arjuna to stand up and take a stance for defending Dharma. This is the whole reason why Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita to motivate Arjuna to become free from the illusion and then stand up and fight for defending and preserving Sanatana Dharma so that others can take advantage of it. So this is my motivation. Everyone can do something and we need to understand that if everyone does a little, then something great and miraculous can happen. Because let's face it, being a follower of Sanatana Dharma is also a freedom. This is a freedom and sometimes you have to work to protect your freedoms or you will lose them when someone else takes them away. History has shown this time and time again. Some people, however, they ask, how can I feel so strongly about this when I was not born in India, not born a Hindu? But, this is, but that is only because they do not see the big picture. And what is the big picture? The big picture is that this is not our first or only lifetime in this material world, and that I obviously had a previous birth in India. <laughs> Anyone who knows me knows that I had to have been a Hindu and a Krishna Bhakta in India in a previous life. Now I've taken birth in America to continue my mission of helping preserve, protect, and promote Vedic Dharma. So basically, I'm only taking up where I left off from my previous existence. This is why I'm so comfortable when I go to India. And so far, I have traveled through all of India except the three small states of Tripura, Meghalaya, and Mizoram. That is also why I'm so comfortable around all of you. You are, you are my Indian and Hindu family. <laughs> However, 
Now it is time to increase our efforts to work together and make Hindus a concerted force that is recognized by everyone. Of course, we know this is not easy, and it's going to take some time, but the sooner we all get started, the sooner we can accomplish it. But there are those of us, such as those I'm sharing the stage with, who have already been working on this for years. We only ask that you make a stand to join together to make a powerful and strong Hindu community. Vedic culture has been changing the world throughout the ages. For example, many have offered their respects to the Vedic culture. For example, such as Henry David Thoreau, Arthur Schopenhauer, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and many others. Anyway, we could provide so many quotes, but you get the picture. The Vedic culture continues to change the lives of many people, but we can accelerate this positive change the more we unite and the more we work together. So let us all move in that direction and become the great force we were meant to be and that this world needs. This means that we must be good Hindus, good Dharmists, good, good followers of the Vedic culture. And that means that we must follow our principles. And to follow them means what? First, you've got to know what they are. We have to uphold things like the Yamas and Niyamas and observe our tradition. But is that so difficult? I don't think so. But that means we also need to be educated in them. Let us not relinquish or let go of our standards because of too much Western influence, but let us interact with Western society as we already do. But let us not forget who we are. What is our real identity? The fact is that more Westerners than ever before are adopting the ways and philosophy of Vedic culture. Like I said, they're looking for what you have. Many are those who want to follow this path. I'm an example of that. And there are many more out there, and many more who want to but don't know it yet because they simply haven't found what we're giving them or what we can give them. That's the point. That in itself is a great, great contribution to the world from the Vedic path. The more we uphold our principles and let others know why they are important, the more they will also adopt our ways. I just met somebody in Florida. He was, he's a vegetarian, he used to bring his Indian lunch to work, and he used to keep it hidden. He didn't want anybody know, to know what he ate, right? <laughs> well, first of all, somebody started to ask, well, what are you eating? He explained why he was a vegetarian. He explained the Ayurvedic principles behind what he was eating, the ingredients, and now he's got 30 people out of the 80 that he works with which loves Indian cooking. <laughs> the point is, it doesn't hurt to try, it doesn't hurt to be open. Like I said, people are wanting to know what you have. This is also why real Hindus need to be educated in their culture to realize how profound, deep, and special it is, and what knowledge it contains then they will be proud of their culture and follow it. After all, we have nothing to be ashamed of, nothing to be afraid of. We are representations of and participants in the most profound and oldest of all spiritual traditions and cultures, and it has the deepest of all spiritual knowledge. And I'll argue anyone who doesn't agree with that. The only thing is that many people don't know that, and I dare say that many Hindus also do not fully know how deep and profound it is because of lacking the education of their own path. This needs to change, and this lack of knowledge is the prime reason why Hindus in India may convert to some other religion. We're dealing with that on a continually increasing basis. To help make this change, we also need to understand that it is a fact that without proper measures of defense and promotion of our culture, you cannot give proper protection to it. And I'm not talking about proselytizing. I'm just letting you know that we have to promote what we have in order to gather more support, more followers, more people who are interested. It is a tough world that things have changed. Most wars now in this world are 80% intellectual. They're not all military. 
we now have to use our intelligence to show what our culture is in order to really protect and preserve it from those who are always trying to demean and criticize it. We must understand that apathy is an enemy. Apathy, the tendency to do nothing, is our greatest enemy. We must conquer our own apathy wherever we may find it. This, in fact, is the teachings of Lord Krishna to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. Are you a follower of Bhagavad Gita? Are you a follower of Sanatana Dharma? Then we must conquer our apathy and take a stand for doing something to maintain Vedic Dharma. We have to be fearless to protect and promote Vedic Dharma. And that's why I'm honored and proud to share the stage today with such people as Dr. Subramanian Swami and Kamal Kumar Swami. They are examples of the fearlessness of which I speak. I am honored in this way. I'm honored to be in front of you and I'm honored to be proud to be called a Hindu, a follower of Sanatana Dharma. But we should all be honored and proud in the same way and willing to work together. We don't have to proselytize, but we can share the benefits of what our culture has given to us and to the world. For example, in Sukhumbarabad, near Hyderabad, a few years ago, there was a Krishna temple that the government wanted to move in order to widen the road. But all the local Hindus came together with a big demonstration to protest, and the state actually backed down. This shows what, begun, what can be done and what has to be done when Hindus unite and shows that we can continue, that we must continue to do this. Then people will take us more seriously and reconsider before they simply get up to offend Hindus and think that there will be no reaction. People will hesitate before taking Hindus lightly or making us upset. But we have to have the determination to make a stand. And once we begin to work in this way, we cannot stop but must continue for the long term and never stop until the goal is reached. Sometimes just by doing a little endeavor, we don't know and may even be surprised at what doors of opportunity will open for us. Sometimes all it takes is that we just start, just put one step in front of the other, and suddenly we step into a force, a current of energy that lifts us along like nothing we have experienced, like a reciprocation from something that is far greater than that which exists within ourselves, but something that far exceeds our own expectations and our own individual power. We have no idea how many times this has happened to me. And I'm sure many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. So can you imagine what would happen if all of us stepped forward in unity for the Dharma and open ourselves to that opportunity to make a difference? Plus, the more we all step forward to do something together, the easier it becomes for everyone. You do a little bit, I do a little bit, pretty soon something big is happening, just like this event today. Everybody steps forward, does a little something, and a nice, beautiful event like this takes place. This is what I'm talking about. It is one thing, however, to say that we are united, and quite another to work and act united, engaged in concerted efforts as one community to protect, defend, and promote our culture. It should not matter whether we are Vaishnavs, Shaivites, Brahmanandis, Shaktas, or even Bengalis, Gujaratis, Tamils, Rajasthanis, or may I say Americans, or any ethnicity. Because when one aspect of the Vedic tradition is threatened, demeaned, or unnecessarily criticized, then it is the whole culture that is under attack. And we must see it that way. We must step forward and be strong dharmas and make a stand for our tradition and its future. So let us support each other in friendship, in dharmic brotherhood and sisterhood. Let us not become divided by minor or superficial differences or labels, but let us gather and see our unity, our similarities, as spiritual beings, all part of the Supreme Spirit. That is the ultimate teaching of Bhagavad Gita and Vedic Shastra. That perception of reality is becoming increasingly rare these days in society. 
but it is an inherent principle and basic reality of Vedic Dharma and Dharmic civilization. That is why I call it the last bastion of deep spiritual truth. Because if we ever lose Vedic culture, the world has no idea of what its loss truly is. It is the Vedic culture which holds the essential spiritual understanding, which is beyond simply moralistic ethics and gives you the higher principles of self-realization. It gives you direct access to the Absolute, the Supreme, not only by descriptions, but by offering the methods by which we can perceive and directly experience it by spiritualizing our consciousness. Basically, you find that nowhere else. Not to this extent. It gives us one of the last hopes for true world peace, actually. Let us not forget that and also help each other raise our consciousness and maintain that spiritual vision of who and what we really are. That will also pave the way for a truly united Hindu society. There is no greater need for Hindu unity than right now, since there are forces that are also gathering that are trying to work against us, as we've heard. The problem is that it is in our nature to respect everyone. And there's nothing wrong with that, except everyone, not everyone, wants to return the same respect back towards us. In fact, there are those who would like to see our complete extinction the complete demise of Hinduism or Vedic culture if they could, such as we have seen in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Kashmir, and so on, and other parts of India. How long does it take before it becomes obvious that we must stand together, even if only to preserve and protect what remains of our culture, and preserve and protect the homeland of our culture, Mother India, Bharat Varsha? We must also... We must also recognize that people or groups who mean to do us harm or even wish for our extinction and then defend ourselves and our culture from their attacks, whatever they may be. But we need to be proactive and develop long-term plans, not merely wait for something to happen and then show some knee-jerk reaction. There are many who already know this and are already working in this way, but can you imagine if the whole Vedic community acted in this way together and supported such plans. It would have profound effects. But many of these more detailed plans you can read about in my book, Crimes Against India and the Need to Protect Its Ancient Native Tradition. But essentially, you need, we need, we all need to work in a way where we can decide where we want to be in five more years. Where is the Hindu community going to be in five years from now, ten years from now? 15 or 20 years from now. Where are we going to be, where do we want to be in 20 years and start making plans of action so that we can reach those goals? That's what we need to do. The thing here is we still have a sizable population of nearly 1 billion Hindus around the world. But have you ever wondered why we are still not as formidable a force as we should be? In places like America, Indians, most of which are Hindus, are one of the wealthiest ethnic groups in the country. And we are certainly gathering influence here. Many more Indians are entering politics like never before. But we still have not become as formidable a force in the world as we could be. And why is that? Well, it's simple quite really. It's because of a lack of organized effort, too much apathy, but primarily a lack of unity amongst us. Many times we come across people who want to do the same things as we do. I want to create something, he wants to do the same thing, but the problem is our egos are too big to be able to allow us to work together. We need to drop the ego. We need to drop, the point of it is, it's not the message that's, it's not the messenger that's most important, it's the message. It's not the act or the work that's mo that or the worker that does the most important thing, but it's the work that gets accomplished which is the most important thing. So with the united force, we could more easily see to it that the laws in government, for example, are passed that help defend Hindus 
rather than take our freedoms away? If we were a united and proactive force, politicians would be scrambling to get our favor. If we are united and proactive, we would get respect from politicians and we could create greater recognition on the importance for them to acquire the Hindu vote, especially in India. We could also have more control over the media that today thinks that being secular means to be anti-Hindu. We would get non-Hindus. We would get non-Hindus or critics of Hinduism to feel that they cannot just say any damn thing against us. Because we won't do anything about it, we need to be a force to be reckoned with. A force that is watching what others are doing for or against us and listening to what they are saying about us and then be ready to stand up and do something about it when necessary. We must unite under a common set of values, concepts, and traditions that can be the universal uniting factors for all Hindus. This does not mean that we give up our distinctions or our lineages or paramparas, but that we focus on uniting on the basis of what we can easily agree on, such as the basis of the Bhagavad Gita. Everyone knows Bhagavad Gita or should know it, and there are all kinds of knowledge within it. But the thing that many people seem to forget is that the Bhagavad Gita is a call to defend Dharma. It is a call to action. That was one of the motivating factors for Arjuna from Lord Krishna, that Arjuna must not run away, as I previously stated, and simply run to the forest, which is what he wanted to do. That's what he wanted. But he must stand up and fight to defend Sanatana Dharma. And we must do the same because as we can plainly see all around us, that without the whole, without Dharma, basically the whole world is falling into hell and confusion as exhibited by the Mahabharata. As exhibited by the Mahabharata, sometimes when all else fails, you have to stand up and fight to protect Dharma and its spiritual principles. We must also have the attitude that no Hindu is left behind, at least no sincere Hindu. A true Dharmic leader or Vedic ambassador will feel this in the core of his heart. Everyone in the Vedic community must see that all Hindus as Dharmic brothers and sisters as being eligible to make the same spiritual progress as anyone else. Why? No Hindu left behind. That means everyone is eligible to enter the temples, everyone is eligible to participate in the traditions, everyone is eligible to participate in the core identity of being a Dharmist, a Hindu. Everyone should feel that they have a place and are valued and have something to contribute, something to offer. This is the basis of enthusiasm which everyone should feel. This is the power of a united Dharmic community. No Hindu is left behind. When this is established, it creates a most positive atmosphere in all who participate. It creates a very positive future, and it increases a winning team in which many others want to join. Everyone wants to be on a winning team, right? And then feel they can stand up and do their part. Then we all become very powerful in our ability to change this world and bring in and manifest the spiritual vibration for one and all. Then we all become a part of that uplifting force which is the ultimate destiny for all humanity, and which is also described in Vedic Shastra, like Bhagavad Gita. But this is also, if I may say so, one of the main principles behind what Kamal Kumar Swami is doing on his Padiatras in India. He goes everywhere, whether it's the villages, the streets, the dusty roads, even the houses of the Hindus, anywhere it takes to inspire everyone to remain a part of the Vedic family, and then work together to help preserve it. It's gathering the tribes, it's gathering support, it's gathering the forces. I have seen it, I have been with him in Tirupati for this very reason, and I applaud his work. This 
is the ideal of no Hindu left behind. And the Dharmic leader and Vedic ambassadors know how to instill this unity for everyone to take a stand, become involved, and to defend and preserve the culture and all who participate in it. Any apathy amongst Hindus is what must be given up and left behind as we all gather momentum to make sure we all have our freedom to follow the principles, the customs, and the traditions of the Vedic path. So to wrap this up, we have covered a number of points, such as we all need to be Vedic ambassadors. What's a Vedic ambassador? Those that are not afraid to say they're Hindu, and they're not afraid to share their culture with others. Secondly, we must be educated in the profound nature of our culture. Practicing Vedic tradition is a right and freedom which must be protected. Another point is apathy is an enemy. And everyone and can must do something. Another one is the Bhagavad Gita is a call to action. And of course, as I just mentioned, no sincere Hindu left behind. We, make, we have to make sure that no one feels they're simply left out, ignored. And we must become united and work in concerted efforts and become a formidable force for Vedic Dharma. So briefly, how do we do this? We must become united under common principles, such as the teachings of Bhagavad Gita, uniting for stopping cow slaughter, united to stop the deceitful conversion practices that try to take people away from Vedic culture, and united for such things as saving the sacred Jamuna River. We should be united to stop the corruption, especially in Indian politics, as we'll hear about shortly. Right? To keep India the homeland of a dynamic and thriving Vedic tradition. We should be united for preserving all aspects of the Vedic spiritual knowledge and for passing it to the next generations. You have no idea how important that is. Well, some of you do. I won't make a pass judgment on everybody, but it's mostly those people that are not here that are out there that should be here. So anyway, we should be united for the protection and promotion of the glorious character of Vedic culture that everyone can appreciate. Who among us cannot join and be united for these points? And the more people who participate and work together, the easier it is for all of us. Don't forget that. And the more we work in such concerted efforts, the more we establish a unified, global, Vedic community. Now it is said that the war of Kurukshetra, the war to uphold Dharma, which was what it was, anybody who criticizes, oh, Krishna taught Arjuna to fight, is an idiot. He taught that to uphold Dharma so that others can take advantage of it. Anyway, this war lasted for 18 days, which changed the world. If all Hindus, Dharmas, Gurus, Sadhus, Bhaktas, etc., etc., all over the world ever really and truly united and work together as a single force, we could change the world in 18 days. Now isn't that a goal worth working for? Isn't that a goal worth fighting for? That, my friends, my brothers and sisters in Dharma, is one of the primary purposes of my life. This is all I'm living for and this is my vision. But we have to share the vision. And I will work with anyone who shares that vision. In this way we can stand united and in this way we stay united. So if you help me and I help you, if you wish me well and I give you my best wishes, and we all work together like that, it creates an atmosphere of strength and positivity. It makes our future very bright and full of potential. And if everyone does a little something to help, fantastic things can happen. Many people will become attracted and want to join and be a part of it. So let us all work together, encouraging each other and become more united as Hindus, followers of Sanatana Dharma, and show the world the great contributions that the culture of Vedic Dharma has given and continues to give to all of humanity. If we take care of Dharma, Dharma will take care of us. 
but just one thing. We have to take the first step. Together as United Hindus, we can do this. That is the potency and power if we stay together, stand together, and work together as a united global Vedic community. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Stephen Knapp for a wonderful speech on Hinduism. It makes me be proud to be a Hindu, doesn't it? I know everyone is waiting for Dr. Subramaniam Swami to speak, right? Sorry, thank you for that. I think when, listen, when we listen to Mr. Stephen uh, Nam, it, it gives me he's like a Vedic ambassador, Sanatana Dharma ambassador, and he's a Hindu ambassador for all of us. <laughs> With uh, Subramaniam Swamiji's fervent, you know, approach for the Hindu unity, one day, my thinking, my vision, is one day Hinduism will awaken the soul of India. That soul of India will lead to Jagat Guru. Maybe the India will become a leader one day. Thank you.